Thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Very, very interesting. Now we're moving on to the Citizens Initiative topic, and Theresa Reedy is here to enlighten us on that. Um, I, I use the laptop, if that's okay. Yes. So good afternoon. Thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation, and I'm going to start uh, this uh, this afternoon. Uh, by taking us to the direct democracy words on the screen, because actually all day we've been talking about direct democracy, uh, but we've been mostly focused on referendums as the instrument uh, of, of direct democracy, and particularly constitutional referendums um, in, uh, in Ireland. Uh, but there are many instruments of direct democracy, and we're now going to turn to citizens, uh, citizens initiatives. And it's probably useful to start uh, by thinking about national elections, which uh, voters go to the polls, they choose their public representatives, and those public representatives uh, then go on to act on behalf of the, the citizens. And, and that's the system that we, we know of as representative democracy. Uh, so the representatives act on behalf of the, the citizens. Direct democracy is where the citizens decide themselves on a specific issue or a specific policy, uh, policy proposal. Um, and in practice, in many countries around the world, uh, direct democracy will often intersect with representative democracy. Uh, there, isn't re there isn't any um, country that we could claim was a pure, uh, had a pure system of direct democracy. Switzerland probably gets closest to that. It has the, the largest number of direct democratic votes. But most countries actually use or integrate elements of direct democracy with their broader representative democracy um, uh, institutions and structures. And from that point of view, it, it's, it's useful to think about how you might use citizens' initiatives uh, and how they are used in other countries uh, to, uh, to integrate with the rep system of representative democracy. Uh, so this afternoon, um, I'm going to take you through pretty much the structure of the, the paper um, that we uh, sent along to you. So we'll talk about different types of initiatives, international experience, and then some kind of more technical issues related to, uh, related to citizens' uh, initiatives. So just to, to get into the kind of um, what we're actually talking about, well, there are different classification systems in use. And uh, to make it very unhelpful, citizens' initiatives are often used to actually cover all of these things. But then citizens' initiatives also have a very specific meaning in and of themselves uh, as well. So a citizens' initiative uh, is where citizens actually propose and vote on a new uh, legislative proposal or constitutional proposal in a small number of uh, countries. So there's a, a two-stage process in, in place here. There is the initiation process for the policy, putting it onto the agenda, and then there is a vote on that particular, a public vote on that particular uh, proposal afterwards. Uh, an agenda initiative is a more limited form of uh, initiative, and, and this is where citizens can propose a piece of legislation for consideration by the parliament. So they collect the signatures and they trigger the decision on the, uh, on the particular policy proposal that's being put forward, but it passes to Parliament to decide at that point, and there's no public vote on the, uh, on the issue. And then there are two types of uh, referendums which also kind of fall into this broader initiative classification, uh, and these really are best understood as kind of veto tools, uh, and these are where citizens have the opportunity to uh, make a decision on a piece of uh, legislation. In an abrogative referendum, citizens can have a popular vote uh, to repeal an existing piece of legislation, and a rejective referendum happens when there's a popular vote on a new piece of legislation. So something that has just been passed by Parliament, there's a period of time within which citizens can trigger this veto mechanism and a public vote can take place on, on whether, um, uh, on whether uh, the piece of legislation should proceed or, or not. Um, the citizen initiative, abrogative referendum and rejective referendum all are two-phase processes. There's a signature collection and triggering procedure, and then there's a public uh, vote. Uh, and in that sense, they all involve campaigns, and there are resource implications in relation to uh, each of those. The agenda initiative is the more limited form of the, uh, of the groups that we're, we're talking about here. 
Uh, the international experience, uh, pretty much everybody talking about these will, will, will always begin with Switzerland because that's where these types of votes are most commonly used. Uh, but they're also used at the, at the state level in the United, uh, in the United States, uh, more uh, frequently at, at local level, both in Canada and the United States. But there are also European countries that have these types of initiatives, and the EU itself has, has brought in a form of initiative as well in more recent years. Beginning with Switzerland, they have both veto of legislation and right of proposal um, on uh, constitutional issues, but, but that's very broadly understood in the Swiss case that there are actually uh, very few limitations in terms of the kinds of things that can be decided. Uh, and the issues that have been addressed by uh, initiative over the, uh, over the decades include tax policy, social, uh, social policy, um, political rights, particularly relating to, to immigrants and asylum policy, are very controversial and have become even more controversial in about the last decade and a half, as some of these posters here um, will be able to, to show that this is a, a very particular issue um, in Switzerland. Uh, from the point of view of, of practical purposes, votes are, are clustered into to groups, and voting takes place three to four times uh, a year in Switzerland. And the dates are actually provisionally set for votes up to 2029, I was reading on the internet last night. So these are planned well in advance. On some occasions, uh, there are no votes that are due to take place, so a date might be missed in the in the calendar, but it is very much set out and organised uh, well into the um, uh, well into the future. Uh, it's important to note that postal voting um, is really commonly used in, in Swiss uh, in Swiss votes, and a lot of the voting actually takes place in advance. And, and just picking up on a point that Michael was making, turnout is quite variable at uh, at initiatives in in Switzerland, uh, and the the general consensus is that the topic uh, that's on the ballot, the the issue itself itself is really a driving force behind whether people actually engage with the, uh, with the issue or not. Switzerland has a very long history with these types of, uh, of votes dating back to uh, medieval times and a lot of this was picked up again in the 1800s so it, it's, some, it's something that they have a very considerable experience with. In the United States um, the experience with initiative votes it really dates back to the early 1900s and there were quite a lot of initiative votes at federal level between kind of the 1900s and about 1920 and then they kind of went into abeyance for a period of time before re-emerging um, as a, an instrument that was used fairly regularly regularly from about the late 1970s um, onwards. Um, it, in the US, at the state level, they have both direct and indirect uh, citizens' initiatives. And what that means is, in some states, the Citizens Committee comes together and proposes the legislation, and once they reach the required thresholds, it passes directly for a public vote on that particular issue. In other uh, states, there's an intermediary step where the state legislature in that particular uh, state may comment or, or suggest amendments. Um, so there is, a, there is that intervening uh, step. So there's a lot of variation that actually is a common theme across the use of, of all of these. Uh, all kinds of issues um, have been uh, addressed over the uh, over the years, and these are just some posters that I picked off the uh, off the internet. Um, obviously, the, um, the the porn stars uh, ones. It was Proposition 60. Uh, its formal known was the Adult Film Condom Health Requirement. Uh, UCC now knows who was googling posters on the, this uh, last week at uh, uh, last week at work. And just to pick up another theme about um, how issues um, might be put to a vote more than one occasion. Cannabis is actually a really good example. Of of that. Uh, votes on cannabis actually first started appearing on the agenda in the 1970s. So in 1972, they had the first proposition uh, dealing with the decriminalization of, of cannabis, and it kept reappearing on the agenda. Um, it was decriminalized in, in 1996, and then it was made much more freely available um, in more, more recent years. So it's an example of something that's been fairly consistently appearing on the agenda over uh, a long period of time. And that's not unusual. Um, in states where you have uh, the possibility to have uh, initiatives, the same kinds of issues keep cropping up over long periods, uh, long periods of, uh, of time. So we've looked at some of these al already um, in, in Michael's slide. So I'm just going to move on a little bit to, to give you some examples from around Europe of the different types of instruments um, and where they are in place. So citizens' initiatives are um, available in a, quite a number of uh, quite a number of countries. In Germany, they operate 
operate again at the state level rather than at the national level. Uh, the Agenda Initiative is uh, to be found in Austria, Spain, Poland, um, Finland, and more recently in the um, more recently in the EU. But the veto uh, tools or the veto instruments are, are uh, less prevalent and found in, in fewer countries. It's also, I suppose, worth pointing out at, at this point that there, there tends to be a lot of enthusiasm for initiative uh, tools, and they are quite popular with voters, and they, they have a lot of, uh, lot of support in the surveys where people are asked, um, do they think initiatives are a good idea? There, there's a lot of support for them. Uh, and there tends to be enthusiastic use of initiatives in the countries where those options are uh, available. But the number of initiatives that actually make it through either onto the ballot in the form of citizens' initiatives or even make it to Parliament in the more limited to the agenda initiative tends to be a great deal less um, than the numbers that are started. And I just want to give you some examples. For example, uh, starting with Finland, um, which introduced this tool in uh, 2012, 700 initiatives have been launched, uh, but just 20 of those have actually reached Parliament to make, uh, to make a decision. Uh, some data that I got um, from uh, Switzerland uh, says that between 1891 and 2010, 378 initiatives were, were launched um, in uh, Switzerland, but just 18 of those was approved. Now, it's important to say in the Swiss case, the success rate of initiatives has actually increased a little bit in, in recent years, but still in all, over a period of over 100 years, you can see uh, that the number of these initiatives that actually are passed um, at the end are actually relatively, uh, relatively low. Um, the agenda initiative is one of the more or is the more limited form of uh, of initiative within the kind of classifications that I have uh, have shown you, um, and I just want to draw the European Citizens Initiative to your attention, and, and this really reinforces my point about the naming of these things. The Citizens Initiative, the European Citizens Initiative, is actually an agenda initiative, uh, and this was introduced under the Lisbon uh, Treaty, and it creates a provision where citizens distributed across the European Union can petition the European Commission uh, to initiate legislation in a policy area where they have the right to make uh, proposals. And the rules require that you have to have one million citizens um, spread across 25% of the member states of the European Union sign the initiative. And once it reaches those verification thresholds, it's assessed to see whether it's, it's legally uh, viable, and then it passes to the European Commission. For its part, the European Commission agrees to register the proposal, um, to meet with the committee that has initiated the proposal, and to give reasons for its decision on the proposal. So there, there's many different components to this in terms of what needs to be uh, what needs to be considered. The European Citizens Initiative was actually greeted with huge enthusiasm when it was first launched in, in 2012, and within a number of minutes um, of the actual platform going live, several initiatives had actually been uh, been registered but uh, there there are only four initiatives that have actually made it all the way through to consideration by the European Commission and partly as a consequence of that and a review was actually um, initiated initiated this year or started this year because there's a sense that there's a, a flaw in the process it's proving very difficult to actually collect the signatures because there are language problems and again these kinds of difficulties are, are not uncommon in relation to uh, in relation to initiatives just a couple of technical things to, to go through. It, it is fairly um, usual uh, in, in, in countries that have limited use of initiatives that there are fairly strict rules around the types of things that can be subject to initiatives. And, and it's subject to initiatives understood in its broadest sense. So this is citizens' initiatives, agenda initiatives, and veto, uh, veto referendums. Um, the IDEA, which is a, an international organization that works on these, produced a very interesting report in 2008. And they identified three broad areas where there might be um, limitations imposed on the subject matter of particular to or, of, uh, for initiatives. Uh, the first of those is restrictions on constitutional amendments. So they say there are lots of examples around the world where countries actually preclude 
exclude certain types of articles in constitutions from being subject to um, a citizen's initiative. Um, examples of those include um, individual rights and freedoms. So, for example, the Slovak constitution uh, precludes any changes being proposed to articles of the constitutions that deal with the individual rights and liberties of citizens within the, um, uh, within the, 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 the constitution. There are also limitations often been to be found in relation to issues concerning the integrity of the state. Uh, so no proposals may come forward in relation to things like uh, war, peace, uh, the natural territory of the state, uh, and these kinds of matters are excluded and, and cannot be the subject of uh, initiatives, either referen veto referendums or right of proposal. And then the last is a kind of a, a broader cluster, and this is where there might be uh, limitations in, in particular policy areas, so citizens can't bring forward proposals, and the really big group in here is actually budgetary matters. Um, a number of countries actually preclude citizens from bringing forward proposals uh, that have very specific impact on either uh, taxation or expenditure uh, or expenditure policies that might constrain the, the government in, in different uh, ways. And there are long reasons that I can go into for why that might be uh, the case. There are also kind of more specific procedural rules um, that are to be considered. The first is whether referendums are actually binding or consultative. And Michael gave you some examples of ones where uh, they were consultative. The governments hold uh, votes uh, and then make a decision afterwards um, having taken the view of the public, but they don't necessarily have to go with that view. And the same is true with initiatives. In some cases, um, they can be binding or, uh, binding or consultative. But there are all kinds of other locking mechanisms that can be put in place in relation to uh, initiatives. And some examples have these, have, have some, or, well, not all of these, but different combinations of, of these. Uh, so you have examples where you may, for example, have turnout thresholds. Um, where there is a set percentage of required voters that need to show up at the polling station uh, for the outcome to be, uh, to be valid. And examples of that is, uh, particularly in Italy, in the abrogative referendum case, you need 50% of registered voters. Uh, the same is true in relation to, to Latvia. Uh, double majorities is, where, is commonly used in federal states where you may have a requirement that you need a majority of citizens and maybe a majority of states within the, particular, uh, within the particular country. We've actually heard quite a lot about double majorities by default because of the Brexit referendum. There's been a lot of discussion about how actually several component parts of the United Kingdom didn't vote for the Brexit referendum. So Scotland and Northern Ireland, for example, actually voted in the, the other direction. So a double majority there would require a majority of votes and a majority of the constituent parts of the United Kingdom to vote for the particular particular proposal. And then a supermajority would say that there is a particular threshold um, that must be uh, reached before the vote is valid. Um, so an example kind of relevant to yourselves is in British Columbia, one of the first places that you had a deliberative um, structure like, uh, like this in place, uh, decided in one of the provinces that they would change the electoral system, um, and PRSTV was actually the option on the table. But the outcome was not valid unless 60% of the voters uh, went for the proposal. So that's a, a super majority. It's an additional um, step that needs to go through. And as you can imagine, all of these things are, are really about requiring uh, as significant a majority as possible, getting voters, get, trying to build a really substantial support behind a particular, um, sorry, a particular proposal. There are procedural rules also in place that you need to consider in relation to the actual triggering of the initiative uh, processes um, themselves. Uh, the first thing is that all of the instruments that we're talking about here, the Citizens Initiative, the Agenda Initiative, and the two veto referendums, are usually triggered by a campaign group coming together, registering their proposal, and collecting the required number of signatures as set down in the law to trigger a particular vote uh, on their particular, on their specific proposal. So here's just some examples from a 2013 uh, book uh, on the numbers of signatures required in a variety of different circumstances to trigger a particular, uh, a particular vote. There are usually two options. Some um, uh, groups have chosen, or some countries have gone for a set number of, of signatures that need to be required. So you must collect 500,000 signatures for the initiative to proceed. Other countries have gone for a, um, um, 
a requirement for a percentage of the number of registered electors. And I just have an example here from California. Uh, for one of their particular types of initiatives, you must have 5% of the number of votes cast for the governor at the preceding, uh, preceding election. So as a general rule, it's either a set number of, of voters or a percentage of the total um, electorate. Only a small number of countries have actually transitioned this signature collection system online. Uh, Finland, uh, the European uh, Union, and I think Latvia are countries that have actually moved this process online. But in, in most other places where you have initiative procedures, that's actually still done by, by pen, and, uh, pen and paper. Uh, there's also a um, signature uh, verification process that has to be carried out to ensure that the signatures collected are actually the citizens' uh, signatures themselves. Some countries check each and every signature, others actually do a random uh, sample, and that process is usually done by the uh, franchise office, the, the, the body that's responsible for collecting, or sorry, for running the uh, elections. You also have a requirement for a time period to be set uh, during which time um, an initiative can be, be live. So I can't pick on a, a particular um, policy that I want to have uh, initiated and spend the rest of my life collecting those signatures and finally, you know, after 30 years campaigning on this, I, I reach my threshold and I finally get my vote. Most countries actually put fairly strict time limits uh, on the period of time that an initiative can be live. The shortest is probably Bavaria, which requires requires you to collect your signatures within two weeks. Um, certain kinds of Swiss votes can be up to 18 months, but on average it's, it's kind of closer to one year is about the kind of time period during which the initiatives can actually be in, in place. There are all kinds of, of other issues though that you need to think about um, in terms of if uh, going ahead with these types of structures you need to think about how will the initiative be named. Uh, and remember from some of our own referendums here, the naming of a referendum can in and of itself be quite controversial. Is this going to be a a referendum called the same-sex marriage referendum? Is this called the marriage referendum? Is this the marriage equality referendum? And there are all kinds of things implied through the naming of the, the referendums. And as a consequence, you won't be surprised to hear that very often these types of issues actually end up in the courts in many of the countries that have, uh, have, these, kinds of, uh, have these kinds of procedures. They also need to think about mechanisms to deal with competing measures. What happens if uh, proposals come onto the ballot paper that actually conflict. Um, so we have somebody who wants to introduce water charges and we have somebody who wants to uh, abolish uh, the existing water um, uh, charging restrictions. How do you deal with that? In some cases, there's a tie break question that's actually inserted into the decision onto the ballot on the day. Um, in the case of some of the states in the United States, it's the actual proposal that gets the largest number of votes. So even where two proposals are passed, it's the proposal that actually gets the higher number of votes that it's considered to be the, the valid proposal. But again, it, where these kinds of things have been introduced, these kinds of issues come up, all of the, uh, come up all of the time. Specific to the agenda initiative, it's worth mentioning that this is a proposal where it goes to Parliament to decide. So it doesn't go to a public vote, it actually passes to Parliament. But there are all kinds of things you have to decide then in relation to how Parliament de decides, uh, what structures will they put in place. Should bills that come from agenda initiatives be given priority in Parliament? Uh, should they take precedence over other legislation that's already on the, uh, on the uh, agenda. Um, what about the campaign committee uh, that's actually brought forward this particular proposal? Uh, do they have a right to be held or heard in Parliament? So for example, the European Commission does meet with the people who bring forward the proposal, as does actually the committees in the Parliament in Finland. So is there a right um, to, to, be, uh, to be heard? And also, should the Parliament actually have to give reasons for the decision ultimately that it, it makes? So there's all kinds of procedural rules and technical aspects that need to be considered. Uh, the it, I suppose citizens' initiatives are one of the most contentious areas of um, uh, one of the most contentious areas of uh, direct democracy, um, and the main reason for that is because the, the kind of evidence is that it does change the nature of politics in a country. When you bring in an initiative process, you're changing the balance of power within the system, um, and that causes a lot of tensions within the system. And there are several key debates, um, I suppose, that should be should be mentioned here. Um, there are both positive and negative 
of things that happen when initiatives are introduced. Uh, on, on the one hand, normatively, um, very often the evidence is that uh, policymakers tend to be more responsive. Um, representatives are more responsive to their voters. They take account more of their voters' opinions and they react to the kind of uh, balance of um, uh, opinion within the, the system. But equally, it has also been said that when you have extensive use of initiatives, it, it can immobilize politics. It can delay contentious decisions because representatives don't want to take decisions that can either be overturned either by a veto legislation or by a right of initiative in another, in another area. So how you intersect these two uh, representative democracy with initiatives is something that needs to be thought out very, uh, very carefully. There's also evidence from the United States that some of the initiatives that have been taken at the state level have actually constrained policy making. So in particular um, areas around taxation and expenditure are very con uh, controversial, especially in the Californian case, um, and that uh, some of the constraints on, on raising taxes have really limited the capacity of state governments to do uh, particular, uh, to particular things. <coughs> Tyranny of the majority really refers to this idea that um, there, there are significant concerns that a majority vote might vote away the rights of individuals. Um, is the majority always uh, is the majority always right? And I showed you some kind of colourful posters from the Swiss case, which really raise this issue. Can a majority vote take away, for example, the religious freedoms, the language rights of minority groups within the system? Now it certainly is the case that international treaties have limited this happening in, in, in some cases, but there are lots of examples um, where these types of votes have been used to, to, limit, uh, to limit minority rights. There's concerns about the role of money um, in relation to who initiates these campaigns, who pays for the signature collections, uh, and there's also evidence to actually show that the expenditure on one side, particularly if you spend a lot on one side, there is evidence to show that initiatives can be defeated. Now, the same is not true. It's generally believed, and the evidence points to the fact that it's not possible to buy a positive outcome, but certainly a lot of spending on one side um, has been shown to deliver um, defeats for particular proposals. Uh, there's arguments about whether citizens really are equipped to actually write legislation. Do they have the kind of tools needed to be able to put um, uh, proposals on the agenda? Uh, the counter-argument, and I think it's one that's definitely worth mentioning, is nobody ever makes this point about our parliamentarians or asks them to pass any test uh, before they put things on the, uh, on the agenda. But it is something to, to keep in mind. And I think the last one is one really where, where a lot of attention needs to be paid, and that is that we, we need to think about voter interest and attention. How far are voters um, actually interested in increasing the number of, of votes um, that, they, um, uh, that they have to make decisions uh, upon? Um, how informed are they about these kinds of issues? And if you are to have a scenario where there were five, 10, or 15 issues being decided at any given uh, election. How would you inform the voters? Um, and how would you inform voters who are maybe not all that interested um, in politics? And certainly there's evidence um, from initiative votes in the United States, particularly in places like California, that voters can use shortcuts actually to arrive at decisions um, uh, that, that are kind of consistent with their own views and values. So who's in favor of a particular initiative? Who has uh, proposed it? Who has been campaigning for it? And, and they can really arrive or use cues and, and shortcuts to arrive at, at those decisions. But as Michael has raised, is this really a, a good way, of, uh, a good way of, of making decisions? And I think an additional complication is that as voters become increasingly distrustful of experts and we spend some time kind of touching on things like fake news, how do we take that into account when we, we really um, look at these kinds of, of votes? I just want to finish off with the, the Irish experience because it was mentioned already this morning that actually the 1922 constitution of the Irish Free State did include a form of agenda, uh, agenda initiative and indeed a veto uh, proposal as well. So the earliest draft of, of the Constitution um, did, uh, did allow that. The, the veto of legislation, which was the rejective referendum, required either 5% of voters or 60% of the members of the Shannon to demand a referendum on a piece of, uh, piece of legislation. The 22 Constitution, when it came in, actually included a provision that it could be amended up to eight years um, by the Parliament, so it didn't actually require a referendum. And then subsequently that was extended again, which meant you had 16 years to actually uh, amend um, the, uh, the, the Constitution. 
Uh, there was also a provision within the 22 constitution that allowed for a, an initiative vote to force the government to bring forward legislation to give meaning to the initiative clause in the, um, uh, in the 1922 constitution. And that actual clause was enacted, I was reading this in a history book last week, nevertheless though, in uh, 37, the new constitution, well, the really replaced all of this. The new constitution in 37, of course, kept the constitutional referendum requirement, but the initiative requirement um, was, not, uh, was not included in the 37 uh, constitution. Uh, the Whitaker report on the constitution did consider, uh, reported in the 1990s, it also did consider uh, the idea of whether the citizens' initiative should be reinstated. Um, it made a pretty uh, strong statement to kind of explain its decision, and it's probably worth reading to you. They came to the conclusion, um, having considered the arguments, that uh, they would not proceed with an initiative instrument because it had the potential to pose the dual risks of affecting inadequate or undesirable amendments to the Constitution and of leading to many fruitless and expensive referendums. So they were pretty conclusive in terms of, of their final decision. Nevertheless, the um, er earlier iteration of, of the, the Citizens' Assembly, the Constitutional Convention, uh, when it met two years ago or three years ago, um, it was much, uh, much changed in its uh, view in relation to Citizens' Initiative, and I've just taken the extract from the voting here, um, and the decisions that were taken, the question was asked, should direct democracy with adequate safeguards be introduced, uh, with 83 voting yes and just 16 voting no, and there were kind of two subsequent sub-questions um, uh, uh, in the event that the Constitutional Convention votes in favour of de direct democracy, which of the following should it apply to? Um, so placing items on or removing them from the legislative agenda, so the agenda initiative, here we had a vote of 80 in favour and 19 against, and specific to requiring constitutional referendums to be held, that was 78 in favour and 17 against, and, and the red um, in, in the text is because this is really terribly boring slide so I'd like to make a grammar point about uh, referendums versus referenda. So the final thing to, to finish up, sorry I've gone over, is really that initiatives are an attractive proposition. Uh, there's no doubt about that. They alter the balance of power uh, within the political system and they certainly give more uh, to, the, uh, to the voters. They give them the opportunity to influence the agenda and to directly make the decisions. They also provide opportunities for citizens to engage with politics on a much more regular base, basis. That being said though, it's also true that initiative instruments are very complex and a great deal of care and thought needs to be given to how those kinds of instruments intersect with existing representative democracy and the existing instruments of the state, which it must also be remembered, are voted for by the citizens. Um, and the literature, while there is some evidence to say that uh, some of the instruments have actually brought people into politics who might not otherwise be that much interested in politics, the evidence is, is quite limited and, and often turnout at these uh, types of votes tends to be a little bit lower than it is at, at elections. Um, and the success rate overall uh, across the world is very variable in terms of initiatives actually leading to particular policy uh, changes. So thank you very much. Well, we've learned an awful lot this afternoon, both from um, Michael's presentation and from uh, Theresa's presentation. And again, I want to remind you that you have papers in addition to having had a, a, an oral presentation. So again, bear that in mind. Um, we're going to break now for coffee uh, initially, and then we're going into our roundtable uh, discussions. So uh, from the point of view of um, our visitors, um, the next public session, we've gone a little bit over time, the next public session will be at 4.45.